tonight's teaching, I want to address many things, clarify a few major points to help us all take really rather large leaps in our spiritual journeys, awakening processes, paths of healing. Of course, in the most loving way. And in the process, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite words that will be woven through tonight's teaching as what I hope becomes one of the most popular words in the spiritual journey. The title of tonight's teaching is What It Means to Heal. Because what I've noticed is that there's many of us on a healing journey, and there's a lot of us that have been on a healing journey for many years, many lifetimes. And there's a lot of us that have gathered an abundance of wisdom. And it's very surprising when we take a step back in the journey that has educated us so much, and we ask ourselves, what does it actually mean to heal? And I say this so that you do not rely on believing that healing is when the change you're waiting for arrives. Healing is when what I want happens. Healing is when I get my way. I would love that to be the case, and I will do everything in my power to help you make it so. But at the same time, I want to really deconstruct what it means to heal from the most clear, wise, and loving perspective so that every day you wake up and you look at your body or your life and if things are not the way you're hoping them to become, you don't get more disappointed and frustrated. Like a child that wakes up each morning and goes, crap, it's not Christmas. Maybe on a spiritual journey, our version of that is, shit, I haven't ascended. <laughs> what does it mean to heal? And in the process, I'm gonna also answer, what does it mean to anchor the light? Because anchoring the light is how we heal ourselves and hold space for the healing of others. And we hear that a lot, I'm anchoring the light. And then holidays come around and you're gonna spend time with your family. I hope I can anchor the light. <laughs> but what does that actually mean? I think that would be a really helpful question to ask. It's like we're all here on this spiritual journey, right? Like Braveheart, the movie, with war paint on and running on a battlefield screaming, and I'm just gonna go to everyone, hey, 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 stop for a second. Hey, hey, put down your spears, hey, hang on a second. What the hell are we doing? <laughs> Helpful. Like, no, we're healing humanity. What does that mean? And if I deconstruct what it means to heal, I think we're gonna find that healing can deepen, be even more immediate, and the role you can play to help anchor the light for yourself and others can be a lot more productive. When we are healing, we are reclaiming the power that past experiences of conditioning, hardship, tragedy, abuse, and neglect took from us. When power has been taken from us, we are stripped of something 
called dignity. Dignity is the ability to feel worthy of honor and respect. And whether your dignity was robbed by an abusive situation, whether it was robbed by a neglectful environment, whether it was robbed by you, by a family of origin that said one thing and did another, or acted in an unloving way, but then said loving words, and so it was very mixed messages. Whether your power was taken from you by the unexpected loss of the one who represented unconditional love in your life. When power has been taken from us, we are living in pursuit of our own dignity. The dignity that says, I am worthy of honor and respect. And here's how you know if your dignity is missing. Because instead of the natural state being, I am worthy of honor and respect just as I am, not as an egoic form of entitlement or arrogance, but the natural confidence of your soul that says, just as I am, I'm worthy of being honored as the uniqueness of spirit, and I'm worthy of being respected, and I celebrate that by honoring and respecting whoever enters my reality. When you don't have dignity, or when it's been robbed from past experiences, you are under the conditioned impression that you have to do something special and spectacular in this world to earn the honor and respect that you have always deserved. And this is why there's a huge mix-up in the spiritual journey on life purpose and why a lot of people mix up life purpose with career choices. Because a lot of us have this feeling of, I've got to do something spectacular that positively affects the world, and once the world turns around and gives me a standing ovation, then I'll finally say, I deserve the worthiness and honor that I've worked hard towards. And that seeking of needing to do something to prove that we're worthy is because we're chasing after the dignity we don't hold to be true in our hearts. And so what does it mean to heal? To heal is to reclaim the power of your dignity. When you have dignity, honor and respect, and you are worthy of it, you do not treat yourself like any particular label. You treat yourself as the uniqueness of spirit and form, and you honor the name this form has been given. When you have dignity on a regular basis, you think differently about what you put into your body. Because it's not just about putting things in any body, it's about being fair to you. And yes, I could eat something that might be delicious and might emotionally soothe me and numb me out for a little bit and give me a little coffee break from my emotional purging, but it's gonna be a lot more painful to digest this amount of choice than to enjoy it. Would that be fair to me? One who has dignity starts to think of the choices they're making for themselves like they would for their own beloved. One who has dignity realizes there's two different versions of self-inquiry. There's what you are and there's who you are. What you are is spirit in form, radiating a spectrum of wisdom, depending upon your level of awareness, maturity, and integration. That's what you are. Who you are 
is the wisdom you demonstrate in your choices. And your lifetime is a scrapbook of how much or how little wisdom you're willing to put on display. And when what you are as spirit does not translate into who you are as the nobility of choices, the gap between those two is how far apart you are from the reclaiming of your dignity. And if you don't have the power of your dignity, it's because it was stripped away from you by a past experience. And the healing journey is how we reclaim that. And the more dignity you reclaim in yourself, the more dignity you shine into the hearts of everyone you encounter. The dignity that says, I will not treat another human being as a label. I will give them the name and the respect of the individual name that they've been given. When you walk down the street and you see someone sleeping in a cardboard box, you don't turn away and go, ooh, homeless person, don't make eye contact, they might attack me. No, that's someone's son or daughter that spiraled so deep into hardship that they are now living as a label and they've been stripped of the dignity of their individual name. And we can give that back to them, even just with one moment of eye contact that says hello. You you, you ever looked at someone who has been stripped of their dignity and name and gave them direct eye contact, there's almost this look of, I don't know if I have the right to receive it. That's how far away from worthiness they are, and you're just helping them return. By giving their history of pain a face. And what most of this world does is it strips others of their face and hides from the pain that people embody by putting a label over them. Oh, other, stranger, someone I haven't liked on Facebook. Someone else's problem. Where's the dignity in that? Because when you honor the face and the name that decorates the hardship and pain in every heart, you are honoring the one within yourself that pervades and expresses itself as all characters. You don't have to get lost and consumed in the pain of all. You just have to show that pain respect by letting that pain have a face and knowing that face has a name. And knowing that name has a past and knowing that that past, if heard, will be healed. And maybe you're not the one who's there to listen to that story, to heal the epic saga that transforms their life, but you can the very least take away the label and give back the face and invite the knowing of the name of the one whose dignity has been stripped from them. Whether it was they worked hard at a, at a business and worked for a company and budget cuts came in and with no explanation, that person no longer has a job that defined them. They had everything. That's destiny calling, by the way. <laughs> or someone who had everything and a tragic twist of fate turned their world upside down and they found themselves unable to recover. 
And then within a blink of an eye, everything was lost. The survivor of that tragedy has a name, and that name belongs to a face. And that face can be seen as your own if you look deeply into it. And when you look deeply into the eyes of another and only find yourself, you have taken the moment to give someone back the dignity that something in their past took away. And that's what it means to be an anchor of the light. As anchors of light, we are the restorers of dignity. And we are restoring the dignity in the world as a way of reclaiming the power of our own dignity and embodying the respect of spirit and form. And in honor of amplifying dignity and respect, let me clarify some old teachings that I think require some clarification. Because when I look at the spiritual journey, you know, I have respect for all teachings. I'm just very clear on what is very much outdated and what is still valid. Everything's helpful at a certain point. And we're at a point in history where there are some teachings that are very helpful and some that are not very helpful. In the old model, there was this misunderstanding about low and high vibration. And here is the litmus test. If you ever want to know how to measure the value of a teaching, do you know what you measure when you measure the effectiveness of the teaching? You measure the level of dignity in the teaching. Is this teaching going to teach me how to respect others more? Or is it going to help me develop more superstitions? If I develop more superstitions, I'm anchoring fear and projecting my dignity further away from me. Remember, dignity is being worthy of honor and respect. So I look at teachings of what is it honor and who does it teach you to respect? And if it's a teaching that lacks honor and lacks respect, it's not valid. So let me give an example. High and low vibration. There's an old misunderstanding that says, none of these bad things would happen to me if I was higher vibrational. You ever hear that one? Who's that honoring? Who's that respecting? Ironically, it's not honoring and respecting the people getting the shit kicked out of them. Because the people who are getting the raw end of the deal are either having their friends say, you know, if your vibration was higher, this wouldn't be happening. Who does that honor? Who does that respect? No one. Or someone who's having all these upheavals goes, God, if my vibration was higher, this wouldn't be happening. Now they're being their own peanut gallery. And it's like they've stepped outside of themselves and are now bullying themselves and judging themselves while being the person who's going through the transformation and adversity. Not helpful. So... That understanding of high versus low vibration can't be true because it lacks dignity. So that's the new definition. If a teaching lacks dignity, it can't be true because truth is always respectful and honoring of all. That's where the rubber hits the road. Here's what high and low vibration really means. To be high vibration doesn't mean you are beyond illness, beyond circumstance. Perfect example. Ramana Maharshi, one of the most enlightened beings who have ever walked this planet, who brought to this earth self-inquiry, the question of who am I? Probably one of the main people responsible for Advaita Vedanta teachings. 
And the list goes on on what this being brought to this planet. And when Ramana's time on this planet was done, Ramana had cancer and left his body. So by the old teachings, Ramana Maharshi must have been this high vibrational being that one morning woke up, ate a big bowl of low vibrational cocoa puffs. <laughs> Holy crap, now Ramana has cancer. And geez, if it wasn't for that low vibration, he'd still be here today. Is that what we think, how this works? Most people don't know how it works, so they assume in, in the superstitious ways of understanding things. High vibration doesn't mean you don't manifest illness. Just like not all illness is caused by unexplored or unprocessed emotions. Hey, here, Ramana Maharshi had cancer? Geez, must not have looked at all that anger. <laughs> it's not that simple. High vibrational beings are just as susceptible to manifesting what low vibrational beings manifest. The difference is high vibration means you have a greater resilience to integrating the wisdom that any moment is awakening out of you. If you fall, you recover much faster. So high vibration means you heal at record speed. You still fall, but you recover rather quickly. And high vibrational being also means that you're able to embody your worthiness and your dignity through the process of deconstruction and not spiral into unworthiness as a result of unexpected change. So if you're a high vibrational being, you recover fast, you learn quickly, you expand into the new vibration that a moment is bringing to you, and you're able to do it in a rather honorable and dignified way and not crumble into why me. A low vibrational being is just a being who is on the path to becoming high vibrational. And they just have an innocent tendency that when unexpected things happen, they turn inward, not towards themselves, they turn against themselves. And instead of supporting themselves, their inquiry becomes endless judgments and superstitions. And let's run towards the high vibration so I can get the hell away from this haunted house of my life. And low vibrational beings take a long time to heal because they're still learning about resilience. Resilience is the ability to fall and get back up quickly. Do you know what gives you that high vibrational resilience? Dignity. Dignity the ability to embody self-respect that says anything that happens to me is a gift of my evolution, and even if I'm experiencing characters turning on me, betraying me, hurting me, and damaging me, it is only inviting me to make my next most bold decisions in my life where life is moving me into a new reality for my own benefit. A low vibrational being is someone who has a tendency to think everything is happening against me or to me, and a high vibrational being says, this is happening all for me. Even if the way in which people are loving me is rather harsh, critical, and aggressive. <laughs> Do you feel how much dignity is in that? How much respect and honor is in that? That's how we measure a teaching. How much honor and respect does it give you? And the, and, the, and the spiritual path of heart-centered consciousness, we are waking up out of the belief in labels. 
But not to go from a human label to a spiritual label, that's just more illusion. That's just going from an ego to a spiritual ego. I'm not my family's concept, I'm God's concept. That's just a reframe. What I'm talking about is waking up out of a label, reclaiming the dignity that your past seemed to have taken from you, cleaning off the damage imposed upon the name given at birth, and making that name God's newest nickname. God's newest emoji. (laughs) The real spiritual path is reclaiming the power of your dignity, which is a process I call clearing your name. So that when you introduce yourself to someone, it's not saying, hi, I'm so-and-so, the one my mother couldn't love. The one my dad, the one abandoned by my dad. The one who couldn't measure up to the people who didn't know how to love unconditionally. Your name is no longer the history of your pain. When you clear your name, your name is a unique expression of spirit and form. And you say your name with pride and you know that your name is a unique vibration of the universe being sounded into existence in the way it's never been heard or expressed before. Clear your name and do what the most enlightened beings aspire to do, which is to speak your name with no apology and no regret. That's the litmus test as to how deeply we have or need to be healed. Can you speak your name with no apologies or regrets? That's why life puts us into social settings with the divine masquerading as other characters. That's why everywhere you go, people go, what's your name? That's God testing. (laughs) Still apologies, still regrets? Someone goes, oh, what's your name? And inside you go, oh God, oh God. Oh God, and you might say your name, but vibrationally it might be, hi, I'm Matt, everyone's disappointment. (laughs) Hi, please love me, please love me. Don't leave me, (laughs) ever. Don't ever leave me, I'll never leave you, I swear to God I'm not gonna leave you. You don't leave me, right? Have you, ever, have you ever met someone and just the sound of their name can transmit all that? Doesn't take an intuitive to know that. Sometimes you don't get that by the sound of the name. You know where you can always tell that? Shaking someone's hand. That's why we do that shit in society. Hey, pleasure to meet you. Whoa, that's a strong grip. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. Ever. Don't leave me, sword. <laughs> Sounding your name into existence and introducing yourself to another with no apologies and no regrets. That is something that is done when our dignity has been reclaimed. And the way we do that because dignity is the ability to be worthy of honor and respect. The way we do that is by waking up out of the belief that there's something you need to do to either be more honorable or there's something you need to do personally, socially, career-wise, any level, in order to be respected. It is to be worthy of your own honor and respect just as you are. So again, as a fun repeat after me, try this out loud. I accept accept that the healing of my heart heart occurs 
occurs through the clearing of my name, which is the ability to sound my unique expression of spirit into reality with no apologies or regrets. And in order to do so, in order to clear my name, I accept that I don't have to do anything to be respected and honored. It is my very existence that is here to be honored and respected. And one of the main reasons I exist is to always honor and respect where I've come from, all that I've survived, and all the places I'm meant to be. I am the one who embodies my honor and respect. And when I am around those who do not honor and respect me, I am witnessing characters who are so far removed from their own inner dignity. They are showing me that they are incapable of acting in a dignified way. And I will have the choice that if this is a reoccurring pattern, my own dignity will invite me to put myself in a different situation. So to give them the space to process the pain that my light distracted them from and to be around those who honor and respect my presence, even if in my reality, the only one who can is me. And if other people have a problem with that, I can either swirl in codependency and people pleasing, and we can take turns begging each other for the validation only we can provide ourselves, or I can clear the space in my life for more, honor, for more honorable characters to arise. Discernment is not a judgment. And when we are discerning in the presence of those who lack their own honor and worthiness, they interpret our discernment as judgment and rejection but that's not what we're doing. That's how they're interpreting. And as of this moment, I release all responsibility for other people's behavior. I release the tendency to identify with other people's interpretations. Just because they say I did something doesn't mean something was done. And I allow all people pleasing, codependency, identifying with other people's perceptions, and all other nauseating forms 
of human interaction to be cleared out of my energy field. Return to the source of its origin. Transmuted completely. And healed to completion now. As of this moment, I accept that no matter how high vibrational I am, it doesn't mean I'm not going to experience adversity. It just means I'm going to heal at a faster rate. I, like other people, might feel like the entire universe is beating the crap out of me. But as a high vibrational being, I'll survive it with honor. <laughs> it's kind of like this big reality check where everybody goes, oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Here's another thing I want to clarify. Let's clarify shadow, right? Shadow, right? All these terms on the spiritual list, ego, e, shadow, ah, right? Right? It's just, it's, it's so funny. Oh, my God. See that person over there? See how much shadow they have? <laughs> Do you see that? Oh my God. <laughs> it's funny. We're all scared of our shadow. We're all afraid of other people's shadow. And when people are lacking their own self-worth and are not embodying their dignity and not embodying their highest choices and honor, we, we, we go in to this scientific exploration of how much shadow do I think they have inside of them? It's like two spiritual people being on a first date, right? Instead of it being like, tell me what you do for a living. So how much density remains in your field? <laughs> and shadow, again, it's one of those things where people go, oh my God, shadow. And I just want to jump out and say, hey, do we know what shadow is? Because yes, shadow is the density of unprocessed pain. Shadow is the intensity of hardship that someone has survived and endured. When you're a heart-centered being and you feel shadow in someone, you want to reach out and go, oh my God, first of all, congratulations on surviving all of that, and I'm so sorry. That's respect and honor. That's dignity. Not like you tune in and go, oh my God, goblins, run away. Shadow is the intensity of adversity someone has endured and survived. And shadow, once processed, is only going to reveal a hero to those still finding their way. A hero that has not fully stepped into their heroism because they're too steeped in the previous chapters of victimhood. They haven't made their way through the journey of redemption. And we help fast track people through the journey of redemption in the hero's journey by just being able to say, wow, I feel the intensity in you. You must have endured a lot of hardship. I'm so sorry for your pain. And my God, congratulations on surviving the unthinkable. It's kind of like seeing someone who's been burnt severely and your human instinct is, ooh, look away. And that person comes up to you and says, if it's hard for you to look at me, imagine what it was like for me to endure and survive this. Dignity. Do we look at someone like that and the label is gross? Or is it this is someone's child? This is someone's beloved. This is the survivor 
of tragedy. This is a hero in the making. And we respect every single person as the hero that they are coming to be. To anchor the light is to transmit the gift of dignity by respecting the journeys, hardships, and experiences of all who walk among you. And what that eliminates out of you, I could say it eliminates ego, but the most accurate term I like to say instead of saying ego is spiritual pretense. Like someone caught you off in traffic. Oh my God, what a so-and-so. Or did that person who unintentionally or intentionally cut you off, are they driving away from being blindsided in the most unexpectedly tragic moment of their life? As you all know, I'm not a pessimistic person. I'm a rather optimistic person. So optimistic that some people hear my teachings and think I'm bypassing and all that nonsense, which I'm, you know, we all know. This is about facing everything with heart-centered consciousness. But compassion will tell you, if you don't know someone else's journey, assume that the moment you meet them, they've just survived their worst. Assume that. Assume they've just survived their worst and it'll be no surprise why they have nothing for you. And in that moment, you will have something for them. And in the moment that you have something for them, you thank them for reminding you how whole you are. Because you can't help another unless you're whole within yourself. And the moment you see someone who has less than you or someone who's in a moment of tragedy, our human instinct is to help. And the reason why the divine masquerades as people in helpless situations is to pull the impulse out of you to help. And every time you help, you realize, if I have something to give another, it means I'm whole within myself. Thank you, helpless person, for reminding me how whole I am. I've been on a spiritual journey. I've been measuring my vibration. I've been muscle testing my ass off. (laughs) I've been debating how much shadow I have, how high and low vibration. I've been in this mental haunted house of a spiritual journey, trying to figure out when is the day gonna come that I'm finally gonna be activated, and all I had to do was give a shit about a human being in pain, and I realized how whole and complete I am. Thank you, God, for suffering in my presence. Amen. We are the restorers of dignity. And as I say all this, you feel the energy fill the room. You feel the light awaken within you. You feel the clarity of how simple at its core all of this is. Doesn't mean life doesn't have complexities. But the truth is always simple. And if the way we are operating ourselves in our human lives and our spiritual lives doesn't seem very simple, like if you wake up and if you've got this endless to-do list of things you've got to do just to be right in yourself energetically, the truth is being missed. The truth is simple. So let's talk simple truth. When you are healed, you act with dignity. And what that means is that you are aware that your choices are the demonstration of your highest ethics and values. And you do not treat people the way your ego says they deserve to be treated. You treat people based on what your values are. And if your value is love, then you love. And if people are not treating you with dignity, then you give them space and say, I love you, but I can't do this. That's love too. 
When your dignity is still at a distance, you are run by ego consciousness, which I can refer to as an illusory level of reality. So what's the difference between illusion and truth? Just to make this real simple. Truth is your actions coming straight from your values and there's nothing in this world that could ever happen to you that causes you to stray from your ethics. Illusion, one who lacks dignity, acts out of accordance with their ethics. And they will say, I only did that because X, Y, and Z. Or if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that. You ever hear that one? What truth says, there is no excuse for acting out of integrity, ever. Even if you're in a reality and the rules were you have to harm another human being to get your next meal, the one who is in their ethics would say, if that's the only way to get my next meal, then I am now a breatharian. And if that choice takes me out of this life, then so it shall be. Nothing takes you away from your ethics because your ethics builds the positive vibration of your name. And when you sound your name into existence, you sound your name with the intensity and veracity of I exist for a reason. And my name represents what you can expect as a reflection of my values with more time in my presence. When we're in illusion, I only did this because X, Y, and Z. There's a very old saying I once heard many years ago, and I love it. I didn't make it up, but God, I love it. And that old saying is, everything after because is bullshit. <laughs> there is no because. There is just alignment or a lack of alignment. And when there's a lack of alignment, that means that you have fallen short or lost sight of your dignity. You ever heard stories of really, really well-intended people doing rather ugly things? Like someone in the heat of the moment gets in some sort of fist fight with someone at a stadium watching a football game and they interview their family, they go, yeah, he's an awesome dad and father, we don't know, husband, we don't know what happened. That's someone who lost sight of their dignity. And that person says, yeah, I did that because. <laughs> no because. No because. The razor's edge of truth is you act in accordance with your dignity in a world where no one else needs to act that way but you. And you have to assume that you live in a world where no one on this planet knows what ethics are. And it's a game of follow the leader. And you're going to act out loving kindness and the world is going to follow your lead depending upon how skillfully and consistently you bring it into action. No one needs to be in integrity but you. And you have to be the greatest example of the highest integrity you've ever encountered. And that's where discernment comes very easy. Bless you. That's where you meet someone and you go, wow, you're a wonderful reflection of the divine. I see your light. And this isn't for me. That's not a rejection. It's discernment. So take a moment and decide, vibrationally, what is the ethic, the value you stand for? What is the thing you want to bring more to the planet during your time in your lifetime, from the time you were born to now until the time you leave? What is your greatest hope of what you want to bring to this planet? And when you zip off into whatever spaceship takes you home, you will look back with your little alien friends, 
Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. <laughs> and you will say, my existence brought more of this to the world. Is your living existence going to bring more love to the planet, more tolerance to the, to the planet, more compassion to the planet, more peace to the planet? That's who you are. Who you are is what you're bringing more to this world. Who are you? And whatever you stand for, you respond verbally, socially, physically, and emotionally from that contribution. And when you do that, no one can bait you into any kind of battle of the wits. No one can take a respected PhD and turn them back into a fifth grader on social media. Nothing more strange than seeing a well-respected, well-aged adult who in the aftermath of acting out of integrity with their ethics, saying they started it. That, that, that's what we do when we're five. They started it. Or if we're spiritual, their ego started it. To reclaim the power of your dignity, you must decide what you stand for. And you must embody that at all costs. And you must accept that every moment in life is just challenging you. Are you going to be reactive or are you going to be responsive? And when you're in the presence of someone who's trying to bait you into a debate or a tit for tat, or someone does something unconscionable to you and there's a feeling inside of you like, oh, I'd love to give them a dose of their own medicine. You take a deep breath and you say, thank you, God, for helping me to remember how important my ethics are. And by choosing to respond instead of react, I'm stepping deeper into my own integrity. I'm reclaiming more of my own dignity. I'm showing my self-respect and I'm honoring myself by not polluting my energy field with retaliation and not bringing violence, criticism, or judgment into my world. It's kind of like if you imagine your inner child is like a baby sleeping. Like imagine someone came to your house and they were talking really loud. They came over and they're just being very loud. And you said, excuse me, there's a baby sleeping in the other room. Would you mind kind of lowering your voice because you're going to wake the baby. And when you wake the baby, the baby's not happy. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind lowering your voice, and the person just keeps talking and talking, you go, look, you're going to wake the baby. So you have to either lower your voice or you're going to have to leave. Now imagine, and some of us don't have children, but imagine if you spoke that way about the child in your own heart. And imagine you're talking to someone and they're acting a certain way, and you go, look, look, look. I, hey, I get it. But the way you're acting, you're gonna wake the baby. <laughs> and when the baby wakes up, the baby ain't happy. Trust me, you don't wanna wake the baby. And someone goes, I don't see a baby. I'm the baby. I'm the baby. <laughs> and imagine even not having to say that to another person, imagine saying it to yourself. You're getting baited into this conversation with people and you're, you know, social media, whatever, oh yeah? <laughs> and you, look, you're gonna wake the baby. <sighs> you take a deep breath.
You ever get into a situation with someone and someone hurts your feelings and you're sitting there just like in an emotional tears? You woke the baby. You are the baby within you. Don't wake it. And it's, and it's not as much as you say it to other people, of course. I know I give this as an example. It's about what you say to yourself. And when other people are acting in a way that might wake the baby, if you had a baby in your arms, you would say, I got to leave. This isn't good for the baby. Why don't we do that for ourselves? Wow, this isn't good for me. This isn't good for me. I got to go. I got to go. Would you ever hold a... This is so sad. And Would you ever hold a baby in your arms and go, Oh, honey, I know this is, you're crying, we, but we can't go because mommy's not done people-pleasing. I'm so sorry. Hmm. When you're older, you're going to people-please too. Then <laughs> you'll know all about this. Your mirror neurons are picking this up right now. Why, would, why wouldn't we treat ourselves with that kind of respect? Here's an interesting thing, and we're all treated differently in our families. But when we're really, really little, a lot of people have that respect to, don't be too loud around the baby, and everyone's trying to be respectful of the innocence of the baby. And then children absorb that kind of respect, and then they, like, fall off their bikes. You ever when your kid remember, like, falling off something and jumping back up like nothing happened? You are resilient. That's the natural state of consciousness, high vibration. You could literally ride your bike into a wall <laughs> and you fall off and you go, well, that didn't work. <laughs> and then you get older, you go through conditioning and age sets in. Like, I've recently gone through a lot of beautiful healings, and I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. But you know what I actually feel for the first time in my life? And it's not a bad thing. I feel my age. I, I'm 41, and I feel that. The other day, it was icy, and I, I, I left my house, and I slipped on ice, and I fell. You know what I realized when you're 41? Falling is an incident. It's an incident. I got back up and I went, I just fell. <laughs> Fuck, that hurt. A lot. You ever wake up the next day after falling? It's like, what workout did I just do? Did I go to yoga in my sleep? This is from the fall? Falling did this? And then the older we get, God bless us, falling is dangerous. <laughs> and the more we reclaim the power of our dignity, the more flexible we tend to become, sometimes physically, but mostly emotionally. And we can hold space for people's experiences and tragedies and upheavals. And we, we can actually have the wisdom that says, if I don't know someone's life's journey, why not expect that I'm meeting them in the aftermath of their lowest point? So that whatever state they're in, you go, God, I understand. I feel the pain. Thank you for surviving that. And I'm sorry for all that you've been through. Do you know what that kind of respect does? It ends confrontation. Because confrontation is when two people are trying to get the other people to recognize and respect them, and knowing is showing each other respect. just the arguments occurring between two woken babies. And if we're going to heal ourselves, we have to realize what we're actually healing. We're healing the pain of being without our own dignity. Some people say that the pain of human suffering is the space of separation we feel from the divine. And I understand the truth of that, but in a world like the one we're living in, 
where like literally overnight, like things look like they've like kind of flipped upside down, right? We went from like world to gangster planet. <laughs> In a world like this, saying the pain is from the separation of the divine, it just sounds too lofty now. 20 years ago, oh yeah, that's something to consider. And not that it's untrue, but the, the, the reality of things is that it's not, it's not as, as specific to say the space between you and the divine, because for most people, the divine is a concept. And so the space between you and the divine is just how close or how far away you are to your preferred concept of divinity. The real suffering is how far away you are from your own dignity and power. And the power is the embodiment of your dignity and the respect you show yourself and others as equal expressions of the one. And when we heal, we are reclaiming that dignity. That's why when I teach the I love yous, what are the I love yous doing but giving you attention honoring your presence, and showing you and your path the utmost heart-centered respect. That's why it works. And for some of us that do it, you know, and it's not in the beginning as genuine, just to be nice, right? I love you, I love you, I love you. Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Screw that Matt Con guy. (laughs) Nice shirt. Screw that guy. It's because when we are not loving ourselves genuinely, it's kind of like a disingenuous meditation. Disingenuous meditation. First of all, genuine meditation, both eyes are closed. Disingenuous meditation, one eye's open, one eye's closed. (laughs) Like when you're a kid and you're supposed to nap and your eyes are closed and you're looking around to see who's napping. When you're doing that, I love you, you're, I love you, I love you, but you're literally just waiting for other people to give you the respect that you deserve. I love you, I love you. And on the inside, I'm waiting, waiting for the respect, waiting for the respect. Keep checking my phone to see if they call. Not yet, God, those people. When we love ourselves, we are not waiting for other people to respect us. We teach others how to respect us by respecting ourselves the way no one else ever has. We teach others how to honor us by honoring ourselves the way no one has ever honored us. And we teach others how to respect and honor us by honoring and respecting others, perhaps in the way they've never been honored and respected. And when you can genuinely honor and respect another human being, from the purity and vibrational clarity of your name. Because any active attachment to ego has beliefs, has judgments, but can't commit to anything. Because to commit even to its own beliefs becomes a moment of intimacy. Because intimacy is about engaging engaging in the oneness in the presence of another. And when someone is in ego, which is ego is basically how we hide from intimacy, because in our beginning stages of pain and neglect and abuse, we were intimately open to all beings, and if we were abused and neglected, that intimacy proved to be a very dangerous place. So ego is where we hide from intimacy. And when we are anchoring the light, and when we are returning the dignity of life to itself, we are abiding in the presence of intimacy. And when you are in that intimate space of just meeting others as a name and a face and not a label, any ill intention they have can't even withstand the power of your light. And even if they have a negative intention, they literally will not even be able to stand being in your presence. Even if they hurl a judgment in your direction, you say, thank you. Really, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Anything else you'd like to share with me? That's when their ego goes, oh God. 
because you've invited into them into an intimate space. You've actually invited them into a space where they have to become aware and accountable of their behavior. What most egos do is they hurl out the judgment and the insult and they get the hell out of Dodge. That's why people like to hide behind keyboards. Da, 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 and they run away. But when you say, that's interesting. That's interesting how you see me. Please tell me more about that. Tell me. Tell, tell me, tell me all the ways I suck. I find that interesting. Please. I'm all ears. And because an ego cannot commit, because to commit is to be present, and to be present is to open to intimacy, and all egos have to fight intimacy, because awakening is surrendering into the light of intimacy, they can't do it. And they will shut down and they will remove your, themselves from your presence faster than you can walk away from them. And all you're doing is being the light of dignity that says, come as you are, be as you wish, and feel the light of God now. And if you're not ready to receive the blast of my light, then you will find a better place to go. And that's okay. But if you want to stand in my presence and if you want to say something sarcastic and judgmental, and demeaning and demoralizing, then I will hold the presence of truth and I will make you aware of what you're saying and I will invite with curiosity more of what you're saying and we will do this dance. You wanna talk to me, we'll talk. And I'll be so goddamn interested in your bullshit <laughs> that you will run faster from me than I can get away from you. Egos always want to tell you what they think. And when you say, please, why don't you tell me exactly what you think? Then that ego goes, uh-oh. Uh-oh, I don't know what this is, but I don't feel very good. Why don't you tell me exactly what you think? because what I'm saying is not just to be funny. There's obviously, there's also deep wisdom in what I'm saying. Because interest is how you return worthiness to people who have been stripped of their own self-worth. Someone who acts in a judgmental and cruel way has no value for themselves. And they are only projecting onto others the reflections and echoes of the pain that they have not faced in themselves. And when you give interest to someone that has been defined in their own mind as being unseen, invisible, and unworthy, when you say, hey, even if you're gonna give me your lowest vibrational judgment and projection and your most demoralizing insult, that's just an echo of what someone else said to you, I'm interested, I receive you, I value you, and I will listen the way no one has listened before. And in that moment, they either come undone and surrender, or they turn away and go find other people who will just hurl back the hurt that they're hurling out to keep them spiraling in their own abuse cycle. But all we do is hold the light and invite people home into the light of liberation by saying, I may not agree with what you say, but I'm interested. And in one level and in the spiritual ego, we only seem interested when we talk to people we agree with. When you're totally liberated, someone who thinks something that you don't believe at all, it's kind of interesting for a moment. Oh, wow, I think rather positive things about me. This person thinks rather negative things about me. I'm interested. <laughs> Give me a difference of perspective.
judgments being hurled at you from other people only hurt for one reason. They only hurt because what allows the judgment of another to penetrate your innocence is your failure to be interested in them. Of course, their words are not meant to be gifts of evolution. Their words are what they hurl at you to keep themselves from the intimacy they're afraid to surrender to. And your interest in their pain and their healing journey that is evidenced by the lack of integrity in their actions gives them whatever amount of intimacy they will let in their heart for their journey. And if you can be interested in the pain behind someone's words, it's hard for those judgments to be believed about you. So when you're interested in the healing journey of another, and even the interest that says someone who treats me this way can only be in a large amount of pain, whether they know it or not, the awareness of the pain of another person frees you of being their victim. That's the living evidence of forgiveness. To be aware of the pain in another that causes them to act the way they act instead of perpetuating their own abuse cycle by being another person who condemns them, who shuns them, who overlooks them, who keeps their light from being seen. Forgiveness says, no matter how dastardly you speak to me, I will never turn away from your light. I may not spend a lot of time with you. There might be a great distance between us, but if in the moment you're going to speak some rather unnecessary words to me, I'm not going to let your negativity cast me in your movie to be another condemner of you. I will not perpetuate your abuse cycle. I will not be another attacker of you just to prove to yourself that this is an unsafe world for you to live in. I will be interested in your pain. I will apologize for all that you've gone through. I will congratulate you for what you've survived, and I will see your light. And as I represent the light of forgiveness, your pain will not hurt me, and my light will free you. Amen. Amen. That's forgiveness. There's a certain level of reality where things don't hurt the way they've always hurt. There is a level of reality, and I can tell you that from experience. There's a reality where things don't hurt emotionally. There's even levels of consciousness where, where physical pain changes. And it's very strange. I've had very strange experiences. I had this experience once, it was very strange. Where I, had, I was holding my laptop and I was standing in my house and I was barefoot and it slipped out of my hand and it fell like with the corner going straight down and it, on top of my foot and bounced off my foot. And I, I said to myself, there is no doubt my foot is severely hurt by that. When it happened, I literally felt the impact and it bounced off. And like, then the scary thing was like, oh God, I don't want to look. And, I, and I, I looked, no mark, no bruise, and I felt nothing. Strangest experience in my life. And I sat there going, how did I not feel that? And earlier, before that moment, there were moments when in my, most of my life, I felt emotional pain. I've empathed the pain of other people. So it's not just like in my life, I've experienced, you know, not just being hurt by people. So I've been a very sensitive person my whole life, so I've taken everything personally. I was always the first to cry in every situation. And even when no one was mistreating me, I could feel the pain in other people's hearts. So whether anyone was talking to me or not, I was processing something. So I understand, from an empathic point of view, feeling so much pain. And there's a part in this awakening journey 
And by the way, when I say this, I don't say this, so if you experience pain, you go, oh God, I'm just, oh. not like that. Don't judge yourself by that because everything is so essential in the journey. But there's a point where you stop feeling the intensity of pain on an emotional level. And it's because you get to a point in your own heart-centered consciousness where judgments are no longer used to turn away from things that feel scary or painful or unfortunate. And instead, you're just on a heart-centered level interested in respecting and honoring the journey of all. Whether they are embodying their consciousness, whether they know all is one, whether they're being nice to other people, or whatever. But we respect that each person each person throughout all dimensions, time and space, and throughout the course of history, each person has and always will be the missing piece that completes the puzzle of the universe. And without each of us, all would never have been. That's a level of respect this world needs. That's a level of respect that you require in order to complete this healing journey and to make your spiritual journey not just dealing with some sort of energetic terminal illness, but to actually start living as the embodiment of your light, where as we gather, our healing and awakening journey can allow us to gather and just to explore new levels of light and new levels of light. And every time we get together, it says, what new level of heaven will we manifest together? And that's why I guide the way I do. With dignity, honor, and respect for the life you've lived, for the hardships you've endured, and for the tragedies you've survived that have only made you brighter than you've ever been before. And I see the brightness energetically, intuitively, and I see it literally. I see energy physically with my own eyes. And I just don't know if you are seeing the you so clearly that I can so clearly see. And so when we come together, my job is to reflect to you what deserves nothing but honor and respect. It is the light of your divinity. And when the light of divinity is fully embodied, divinity becomes a different word. Divinity becomes a word called dignity. Dignity is what happens when your divinity is active in you. And when it's active in your words, and it's active in your choices, and active in your behavior, worlds transform in your presence. That's what it means to heal. That's what it means to anchor the light. to respect yourself and to honor others until nothing but the light of perfection remains. That's the love revolution. <laughs>